Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on polymer enhanced oil recovery. My name is Jelaine Fortin. I'm the technical account manager here at Interface Fluidics, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, I'm joined by Scott Pirabon, who will be leading you through today's talk. Scott is a senior scientist at Interface. He holds a PhD in microfluidics and microbial studies uh, with a background in physics. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone to please post any questions in the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to get to them in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, feel free to reach out to us at webinar at interfacefluidics.com. As well, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So you never miss out on future webinars and any updates on the technology coming out of Interface. Uh, the links have been posted in the chat for you. So Interface Fluidics is a company that transforms how the energy industry gathers and uses fluid information for more accurate, cost-effective, and environmentally conscious decision-making in the field. Interface's technology shows you how fluids behave at the pore scale and provides critical phase behavior information for building computer reservoir models. Our solutions have helped the energy industry cut chemical costs, improve ROI, and take the guesswork out of operations. Smaller sample sizes also mean less energy use and lower emissions. Our laboratory facility is located at the National Institute for Nanotechnology up here in Edmonton, Alberta, and our corporate headquarters is in Calgary. Interface has experience working in many reservoirs around the world, some of which are shown there on the map. Our technology allows us to gain insights and provide solutions for fluid flow through porous media, from frac fluid optimization, enhanced oil recovery, dealing with anything like foams, nanofluids, to polymers, which is the topic of today's conversation, and even SEGD. We also offer a suite of PVT and phase behavior analysis, specifically minimum miscibility pressure and MME. Um, helping facilitate carbon sequestration and gas injection, as well as wax and asphaltine onset conditions and diffusivity. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott, who will walk you through today's webinar on polymer enhanced oil recovery. Thank you, Julian. So what do we mean by enhanced oil recovery? Well, that's any recovery method that alters the fluid properties involved in production. And historically, it was classified as a tertiary recovery method after straight water flooding as a secondary method, and after your primary um, using the, the pressure differential in your reservoir to produce oil. So under that old classification, you can find miscible flooding, for example, uh, supercritical CO2. Uh, there's thermal flooding, like in situ combustion, uh, microbial flooding, and under chemical flooding, uh, the big three names are polymer, surfactant, and alkaline. So currently worldwide, uh, under their 11% of EOR projects use chemical flooding, and over three quarters of those use just straight polymer in your water phase. Uh, the remainder are polymer mixed with other additives like surfactant. So why is it so popular? Well, we can show you. So here at Interface, we make microfluidic uh, reservoir analogs that give us visual access to the fluid-fluid interactions in uh, porous media, for example, here. So this is, uh, both of these videos are uh, the oldest and biggest microfluidic uh, chips that Interface has made. Uh, they're very long, they go well past the right side of the image, which is why it's uh, faded out. Uh, but here we're injecting water uh, that's dyed blue into an oil phase that's dyed red. And so you can see that uh, with additional water injection, you're starting to sweep a little more oil. Um, and if I fast forward the video a little bit, you can see in steps that it's a pretty incremental uh, marginal recovery after the first uh, wave of water goes through. That's especially uh, um, seen here at the injector, uh, where the stochastic path that the water first took uh, resulted in a low resistance path. And so the water prefers to keep that path and bypassing that oil that's near the injector. But if we take the uh, final image from this video as the starting image in the tertiary flooding video, where here we've added polymer to the water phase and dyed that entire mixture green. So you can see already, if I start this, that the, uh, the polymer water mixture does a better job of sweeping that oil that's near the injector. And if I step ahead in small steps, 
just very visually, you can see that it does a much better job of sweeping that oil. So polymer uh, enhanced oil recovery is a very effective method to reduce that viscous fingering effect that you see in the cartoon here, uh, and it increases the, the stability, the conformity of your sweep front. At the same time, it can also decrease uh, the produced components that you don't want, like water cut, uh, and lower your water consumption. And those two uh, points are tied in that if you reduce viscous fingering, the chance of breaking through to your producer is reduced so that you're not just producing mainly what you're injecting. So uh, in the categorization of, of those EOR methods that you saw on the previous slide, uh, polymer enhanced oil recovery is one of the lowest cost uh, among all the other methods. And within chemical flooding, uh, in, in practice in the field, it's often the lowest cost method. So at Interface, we use um, these microfluidic analogs uh, where a modern one is on the, the, uh, the bottom right image here. That's, it'll make another appearance uh, later in this slide deck. So what's actually happening though? Why are we avoiding viscous fingering or how are we doing that? And how are we improving that, that flooding conformance? Uh, you can think about that in terms of uh, mobility control. So the mobility of the displacing fluid, which is water displacing oil here, this is the land to term, um, is just a ratio of the permeability of that displacing fluid in the context of the, the porous media that the water is in, um, divided by the viscosity of that water. So if we insert uh, polymer into the water to increase its viscosity, you effectively reduce the overall denominator term here, this mobility ratio m. And when that ratio falls below one, uh, you're more in a, uh, um, a stable sweep front condition. If it's greater than one, uh, you have a greater chance of seeing that viscous fingering effect. So this is a more modern uh, example of uh, what we do at Interface. So this is a fluorescence image of a high pressure, high temperature microfluidic uh, analog, um, where we have a heterogeneous uh, pore and pore uh, throat network structure. Um, because it's imaged in fluorescence, that is, we're using the natural fluorophores in the oil in response to blue or UV excitation uh, to light up, and that's what's colored light green here. Anything that is not fluorescent in this imaging modality uh, appears as background, which is colored uh, dark blue. So that could be any fluids that don't fluoresce, like water or gas, uh, or the structure of the analog itself. So we're, in this case, we're injecting water. Um, and I'll let uh, the video loop as I, uh, as I talk over it here. So initially, between the pore and, uh, injected pore volumes, uh, 1 to 2.5, we uh, get, it's, it's the same injection conditions, the same flow rates, the same pressure drop. Um, the water takes stochastically different paths through the two, the top and the bottom video, but uh, the overall recovery factors uh, track very similarly. They start to diverge once we start injecting polymer with high loading in the, in the top video or, or low concentration in the bottom video. And this is a nice sanity check too, because when we turn the polymer flooding off, you can see that that difference in recovery factor uh, doesn't go away. It's sustained as we go back to just injecting the water phase as brine. So these uh, analogs at the pore scale, they're very heterogeneous, but if you zoom out and you see the whole thing as we are, uh, it's actually quite homogeneous overall. There's no um, large sections of the analog that have uh, drastically different permeability or porosity. But that is something that you can find underground. So we can design analogs uh, for, for other test applications. So in this case, an example would be thief zones. So thief zones um, metaphorically steal the injected fluid because they are large areas of the reservoir that have uh, very much lower permeability than the surrounding areas. And so you can bypass very large areas of oil laterally or vertically. And so um, if we design a microfluidic analog that has this drastic change between permeabilities uh, top to bottom, in, this, in the case of the chip on the right side here, we can do uh, um, conformance studies um, relative to the, the, the polymer or whatever other additive you might want to test. So this uh, is a video that's featured in one of our blogs and also on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a uh, a longer explanation for what's going on there, but for the Coles Notes version for this uh, webinar, we've got uh, zone K1 at the top, which has the highest permeability in fluid communication with every other zone. Zone K4 at the bottom has the lowest permeability. Now, the reason why K1 and K2 look identical to K3 and K4 is because we don't have depth information here. Um, K1 and K2, the channels uh, are actually just deeper. So, uh, and then between K1 and K2 and K3 and K4, they both differ by the same ratio of porosity. 
So let's inject some water in a brine phase and see what happens. Um, initially, this video is uh, being played back at 540 times speed uh, as the water finds its low resistance path, of course, preferring K1 overall uh, through uh, from injector to producer. It slows down here to 20 times speed in the playback just to show what happens once that water, initial water path makes contact with the producer, which happens now there in the upper right. So you see immediately there's this mobilization of oil and it sweeps out the thief zone. It identifies the thief zone to us. So we know that it spans K1, K2 and parts of K3. So now the video is speeding back up, showing that as we continue to inject water in the, uh, at the same rate, uh, we're not sweeping that much more oil. A little bit in terms of the zone K3, uh, but not really that much in, in terms of the other ones. Um, we then start to inject a polymer water mixture at the uh, vertical line in hour five there in the plots. Uh, and that mixture takes some time to get from our pumps down onto the reservoir analog, and then also mixing with the existing water in that analog. So with the sped up video, we'll just wait until that mixture gets onto the chip and you'll see a very marked change, right? So in all zones, we've swept more oil in the thief zone and outside it where it was bypassing before. Uh, and so this is a, a, just an example of the kinds of um, tests that we can do at interface uh, to investigate these kinds of interactions. So in terms of uh, polymer flooding applications, um, you might start with literature review and find that Acrylamides and xanthan are the two big names. Acrylamides are mainly um, HPAM uh, variants. Uh, that's a synthetic polymer. Uh, xanthan um, is akin to xanthan gum that you might see on the nutritional uh, um, labels on, on, on packets. Uh, it's a biopolymer and not ionic. Uh, but these are both, even though they're, they're widely used, they're both susceptible to thermal salinity and uh, microbial degradation. So you'll have to know those conditions in your reservoir uh, to see whether these are appropriate to use. Now, once you've selected your polymer and you've put it in the water phase, it's no longer really just a polymer. It's, it's a hydrated sphere of polymer. Uh, that's especially true if it's charged or polar and has some interaction with the water in terms of charge shielding. Um, in addition, uh, the, the salinity of your reservoir uh, can affect that hydration sphere. So you'll have to know, uh, you'll have to compare the size of that hydration sphere uh, to the, the, the pore size distribution of your reservoir if you want to avoid or maybe encourage blocking depending on your application. Um, so there's the plugging and trapping issue there. There's also absor absorption if there's some affinity for your polymer to your rock wall, which can shift down your whole uh, uh, pore size distribution. Uh, and increase the, the flow resistance. And then of course, zooming out from that level is the, uh, an easier, uh, more easily understandable metric of, of uh, changing your concentration uh, versus cost. So the, uh, the table here in the bottom right was lifted from a review article that was recently published on EOR methods. The authors uh, in this table give you seven uh, evaluation points uh, to determine if polymer flooding is right or wrong for you. Uh, now you can see that the addition of alkaline and surfactant, which are the SP and, and ASP um, uh, flooding parts of the table there, relax these conditions somewhat, but not, not too drastically different from just straight polymer flooding. And so this is a very lumped element view of your reservoir. There's of course very advanced simulation models out there where you can uh, evaluate whether your selected polymer or additive um, is gonna behave well uh, with your known reservoir characteristics. Um, but we at Interface believe that uh, the proof is in the pudding, that when you do a test that really represents the, the uh, surface conditions and the fluid conditions and the, trap and the, the confinement conditions of a uh, uh, reservoir, um, it, it, it uh, gives you a, a validation uh, to your simulation results. And also you can uh, play around in a quick experimental uh, platform um, uh, all the, the different uh, uh, variables that you might want to consider. And interface considers a lot more variables than just these seven. So we can control for flow rate and time. Uh, we can control temperature and pressure at reservoir relevant conditions. We're always upping our game in terms of pr pressure and temperature. Uh, currently interface uh, probably uh, can uh, replicate those conditions in 80 or 85 percent of the world's uh, plays right now. Uh, we can also control the reservoir characteristics by the design of these quasi 2D uh, analog uh, uh, chips. So we can control porosity and permeability, grain size, the pore throat size distribution, 
we can control wettability of the, the walls, the channel walls to the fluid uh, and verify that in terms of contact angle. We can make closed and open-ended conduits for studies like diffusion or, or inhibition. Uh, and of course, we can control nature of the chemicals that we put on those uh, analogs. So that's viscosity, density, pH, salinity, even uh, reaction uh, chemistries like gel and crosslink repairs, uh, which you can imagine in the past video could be used to, to block uh, injection fluid access to those low perm regions. Uh, so those are the variables we can control. Uh, the variables or, or the, the evaluation metrics that we use are much longer than the list on the right here. Um, of course, the, the, the king of all those metrics is oil produced, whether it's from your reservoir or from your reservoir analog. Uh, we can also look at regain conductivity. Uh, we can uh, evaluate flow assurance. We can evaluate in situ rheology. So the, the behavior of the fluids when they are confined with the relevant uh, capillary numbers, interfacial tension, um, uh, which gives a, a, a sort of a the proof in the pudding uh, answer of, of how your fluids might behave in the reservoir. Uh, and of course, because of the visual access, we can look at the emulsion distribution directly and quantify that over the whole area of the analog uh, and many more. For example, one more would be gravity, which is what's shown on the chip on the right here. So this is, to the best of our knowledge, the largest microfluidic chip in the world where we, we did a drainage study that involved uh, gravity effects on the microfluidic scale. Um, and it's uh, also the chip that you saw at the top of the slide deck in the videos. So I mentioned in situ rheology. Um, so here's an example of a client that came to us uh, wanting to evaluate uh, two different polymers uh, relative to the poor throat size distribution and whether it uh, had, uh, whether these polymers could um, lead to formation damage. Um, and there's, it depends on your application here. You might want to prevent plugging of your, your reservoir or you might want to encourage it if you're trying to divert injected fluid. Um, so if I wanted to avoid formation damage, it's very clear from these results, I pick polymer A, for example. This is another example of um, a paper we, we co-published with a client in Nature Scientific Reports. Uh, in this case, uh, foam, it's on foam flooding conformance using surfactants, but the same principle can apply to polymers and nanoparticles or any additive. So the, these authors did uh, bulk scale measurements of the stability of their, their uh, surfactant formulations to making foams and found that all those formulations had less than 10 second foam half-life in the bulk phase. When they put it into a reservoir analog, there's a huge divergence in the results, which is the bottom uh, row of that table in the middle there. So it's anywhere between less than a minute and well over two hours. And so uh, in the, the plot in the bottom right, it also shows uh, the large testing matrix that we, we used uh, to come to these results. Uh, we tested, I think, seven different formulations, more, more than shown in the table, seven different concentrations, uh, each of them at uh, five different uh, foam qualities, which is a ratio of the supercritical CO2 mixed with their foam formulation. So these are just a taste of the, the kind of analyses that Interface can do for you. So the take home message here is we can help you make better decisions faster because of the small scale of these reservoir analogs and the fast reaction kinetics and, and the interaction kinetics that uh, happen on them. Um, it's a low cost, low risk reservoir testing platform. Um, because the results come so quickly, we can do many uh, repetitions and show you those tight error bounds uh, that give you the confidence that these are repeatable results. We can do large matrix screening. And of course, we can give you all the poor scale visual insights that we can see, which uh, are backed by the more classic uh, uh, data of uh, flow pressure and temperature logs. So with that, I'll hand it back to Jelaine. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, so we have had a few questions come in through the Q&A throughout um, the course of the presentation. Uh, so the first question we have here comes from Alice. How long does an experiment take? Um, this compared to conventional testing? Yeah, it, it uh, depends on uh, the test conditions. So we can do a variety of flow rates and a variety of, of different analogs uh, with, with greater or less um, you know, flow constrictions. But if I had to give you a round number, uh, it would be on the order of hours uh, for one of these chips that are on the order of about an inch in size. Great, uh, we have another question here. How do you match surface properties? Right. So uh, mainly through wettability. So we do um, a coating uh, method to change the wettability of the, uh, the natural uh, reservoir analog materials. Um, 
and, uh, and we can verify that with contact angle measurements. Um, but that, that's our main method. Great. Uh, another one here. What range of oil viscosities can you work with? Um, all ranges. We, we've studied oils from mineral oil, you know, kitchen cooking uh, uh, substance, to all the way down to really heavy bitumen. So six to eight orders of magnitude in terms of centipoids. Great. Um, and then we um, we had another question here about um, the the water bypassing through the oil. So maybe you can speak a bit to how how we mitigate that in our system. Right. So that's. Um, has to do with that mobility ratio. Um, so if we, if there's a large viscosity difference between two fluids, uh, one fluid is going to have a higher mobility to get through it um, in, in any porous media. And so the, the idea here is uh, we have, in, in order to slow down the progression of one fluid, we can increase to match their viscosities. Great. Um, I would encourage any attendees here to feel free to post some more questions in the chat. Oh, have another one here coming in. Great, thank you. Can you comment on the application of polymer flooding in unconventional tight and shale reservoirs where permeabilities are in the range of tens to hundreds of nanodarcies? Have you done any tests for these reservoirs? Well, we, we can do uh, tests for, for any reservoir uh, characteristics as long as we have all the, the for example, that, that seven point uh, list of porosity permeability. Um, I, I don't uh, want to directly answer the question because I don't want to overstep my, my knowledge here. We do have um, uh, a, a petroleum um, experts that can probably better answer this question if you want to follow up. Um, but as a test platform uh, to evaluate whatever fluid in whatever situation, uh, we, we can probably meet that. Perfect. And just to build on that, we do have, um, it kind of depends on the application, of course, but working with uh, friction reducers and, and gels and, and different uh, chemistries in, in shale reservoirs, that is something that we do quite frequently. I um, have another question here. Thank you, Daniel. Can these tests be done in high temperature, high pressure environments? Absolutely, that's uh, that's very much in our wheelhouse, and it's it's the primary uh, uh, moving force for interface to constantly try to reach higher temperatures and pressures. Uh, so currently, uh, Julian, if you want to speak to our our, our published limits, sure. So, <laughs> of course, um, we're always trying to achieve higher temperature and pressures and take over more of uh, the different reservoirs throughout the world that we can work in. Typically, for polymer applications, uh, just inherently to um, polymer itself, it tends to be in lower temperature, lower pressure pressure reservoirs. Uh, but in terms of interfaces capabilities, we're over 3,500 3, PSI uh, for our EOR applications and 200 degrees Celsius. Great. Um, was there any more questions? Please feel free to post them now. I'll give it a, a couple minutes, but I want to thank everybody again for attending our webinar. Um, we will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel, so feel free to share it with your colleagues or refer back to it. Um, as well, subscribe to all of our social media. Uh, we will be having an upcoming webinar in August on our Regain Conductivity Solution, uh, and then more to come after that. So thank you again, and have a great day.